Ravan will do it. See, it's already there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tankam Taiwalikakat um, from the School of Dentistry. So she is the, uh, a faculty member at the School of Dentistry and also the director of the Dental Informatics uh, core there. Um, I'm very excited about uh, her presentation for multiple reasons. One, um, there is a huge opportunity in leveraging data from dental practices um, that she's going to tell us about. We also have another opportunity here in terms of being able to link dental data with medical data. And uh, Heather Taylor, who I don't see in the audience, but uh, a PhD student in the T15 program is there, and of course, uh, we are building on Tom Crump's work. And finally, I have made a professional breakthrough today. Tom Crump just confided in me that I used to make her so nervous when I would sit in the audience. And she said to me today, you know, I'm so confident today because you're here. And I'm like, that's not how it used to be. So with that, please welcome Tom Crump. Thank you, Titus. And um, as Titus mentioned, yeah, I don't feel, I think I'm not feeling nervous because years ago, Titus would try to remote control me with his eyes when I'm presenting. <laughs> and that was, and I would go just speechless in the middle of the presentation. But I think I have overcome that. <laughs> Thank you, Titus. So as Titus mentioned, um, today I'm going to be presenting uh, results from one of our major study uh, that we have been doing during the last three and a half years. It's about leveraging electronic dental record data for clinical research. Now, just to show, we it's th that's not just one project that we, are, we have been working on. Uh, um, our goal in dental informatics is to improve oral health, both at the population level and at patient level, by applying informatics approaches to improve uh, preventive management, and that way, uh, you know, reduce dental care costs, bring best evidence to the point of care, and um, improve dental outcomes. So uh, with that, we have several projects. We have been working on many projects. One of them is the specific project that I'm going to present today. We are also working on characterizing patients periodontal disease status using electronic dental record data. My PhD student, Jay Patel, is working on it. And we have also linked our patient's dental record data with medical record data in INPC to identify patients with uncommon conditions such as Sjogren syndrome, um, who, uh, which, you know, for those patients, their major complaint is, complaint is dry mouth, which is a major risk factor for tooth decay and the leading to premature tooth loss and that way impairing their quality of life. We have also performed needs analysis to enhance care coordination between dental and medical providers. And finally, actually today, we are going live with a randomized control trial to evaluate tobacco, a tobacco cessation counseling tool we, which we developed in a previous study that assists dental clinicians on educating patients to quit smoking. So this is just a nutshell of the projects we are working on. And coming back to the topic at hand, uh, which is leveraging electronic dental record from private practices, a major motivation for doing this is really to uh, determine the feasibility of using dental record data from private practices to, to evaluate treatment count outcomes. And in this study, we looked at two major treatment outcomes. One is the restorative or uh, restorations or fillings. And as you may know, that's one of the common, uh, most common dental procedure we perform in dental practices, uh, which is to treat tooth decay or caries, uh, remove the tooth decay and restore the tooth form by a filling material. And as you may all know, when you see this picture, this is a amalgam filling or a silver filling which is commonly referred as. That's the common, most commonly used material, and we have been using it for more than 100 years. It's a time-tested material. Uh, 
However, in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, there have been a lot of uh, concerns about using this material because of the presence of mercury in this amalgam and also the need to remove more tooth structure. And what has happened is the emergence of a tooth colored filling material called composite restorations. This has been in use since the 70s. And early on, we were using it mostly to fill our front teeth for aesthetic reasons. But in the mid 80s and 90s, we dentists started using it to fill all the teeth because mainly because of the ease of doing the, uh, using this material because it's less technique sensitive and it's you know it's aesthetically pleasing so patients love that and we uh, we don't need to remove a lot of tooth structure so that's it you know it's uh, uh, we are being more gentle to the tooth structure we want to conserve as much as tooth structure and reduce the risk of tooth fracture down the road however early materials had a high rate of recurrent decay, especially around the filling materials. And patients always com also complained of tooth sensitivity for even after getting the, this, uh, this filling. And uh, the, right now, we have very limited long-term studies about this material compared to amalgam restorations. We do have clinical studies, but the problem is they have limited generalizability. And as we all know, clinical research, they are great. They provide valuable insights, but then we, have, we are challenged with difficult enrollment and poor generalizability because oftentimes this, these studies are done in major organizations and that's not the setting where most people receive dental care. So um, traditionally, you know, historically, dental outcomes have been assessed mostly using insurance claims data. As we all know, insurance claims data, they are valuable. They provide great insights. At the same time, there are some drawbacks because this data is uh, obtained for reimbursement purposes. So we may be missing out on outcomes among those patients who may not, who, who, did, who were not covered through insurance, who were either self-paid, you know, or had other ways of paying for their dental care. We also won't have any insights on why they received a particular treatment. So that's why that's where electronic dental record data is becoming a very valuable resource. And as this figure shows, you know, if you look at this figure shows the rate of adoption of uh, computer systems in dental practices, first for the administrative purposes, and this is the black, the, all these black bars show adoption of uh, clinical systems for patient care documentation. And the last, you know, the one done in 2011 showed, that was by Titus, it showed more than 75% practices in the United States used electronic dental record systems to document patient care, you know, and about 15% were complete paperless. Now, fast forwarding to now in 2019, we have at more than 90% of practices in the United States using electronic dental record data systems. And the reason is most dental schools are now maintaining paperless systems. So graduating dentists, they prefer using electronic dental record systems over paper-based systems. And this study was um, Support funded through the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. The, that's where uh, we recruited our practices through this network. So this is a network established by the NIDCR, the Dental Institute of NIH. Uh, it was created in 2012. It's a $65 million initiative. And the goal of this, uh, of uh, establishing this network is to take research to practices where most population receive care instead of conducting research in academic settings or in big organizations so that we can uh, translate, accelerate uh, 
um, translating the research evidence to point of care much faster. And at the time of proposing the study, we had uh, the network had about 2,500 practicing dentists and hygienists. Now it has grown to about 8,000 practicing dentists, and this network got renewed very recently. So they're going to be there for the next seven years too. And this map shows the six regions under the network. Uh, there are six uh, re uh, net, uh, regions, regional uh, with regional headquarters. We belong to the Midwest. And uh, this, uh, we recruited our practices from all the six regions through the network. And our study objective was, actually the overall objective was to assess the feasibility of using electronic dental record data to assess treatment outcomes. With the two sub-objectives we had was, okay, let's assess the documentation completeness of selected variables that's required to do survival analysis of two treatment outcomes, posterior composite restorations and root canal treatments, because that's another common procedure which we do to um, prevent tooth loss and determine the survival time of these two treatments and assess any difference uh, by age, gender, insurance, and the network regions. So we recruited 99 practices um, nationwide through this uh, uh, network um, and who used two major systems. Dentrix and EagleSoft. And uh, we considered a practice eligible for the study if they have been using a electronic dental record system for at least five years and have been performing these two procedures for at least five years. Once they enrolled in the practice, uh, in the study, we extracted the de identified database and then retrieved the selected variables for analysis. This flow diagram shows how we um, got the data. Uh, as I said, the once the dental practice enrolls, they would contact the vendor uh, to uh, seek help in getting the data out of their system. The vendor would uh, extract the data based on the study requirements, de-identify the data, and then transfer it to us through secure means. I know this may sound very simple. I have to say we, it took two years for us to <laughs> come up with this plan. And once we got the data, we would um, generate a text file that contained the study variables of interest to us. And uh, we would perform quality checks. And after the quality checks, those text files are loaded into a relational database. We also uh, translated uh, these the data from the two systems into a common data model, um, ontology model. And that was translated into the OWL files and loaded into the triple store. So that is another significant accomplishment of this study. So, Coming to the results, um, regarding the documentation completeness, we only assess the completeness of very few variables that is really necessary to perform survival analysis. And here we looked at whether the tooth number fields were, uh, you know, complete and accurate, tooth surface, which surface was filled, uh, for the restorations, it, it didn't, that was not relevant for the root canal treatment and the dates of treatment. We also looked at uh, the completeness of date of births and whether they were correct or, and everything. Now, um, for these variables, it was near 100% complete. Uh, and there were only very few observations that were missing. So that was really good. And uh, we, the final study data set had about 218,000 patients. And most patients were between 18 and 44 years. We had slightly more female patients at 56%. And in terms of procedures, we had about 829,000 posterior composite restorations and about 71,000 root canal treatments. 
um, since we are from the Midwest region, you know, about the, these numbers show the, what we had from the Midwest region practices too. It's about 100,000 for posterior composite restorations and root canal treatments, uh, about 10,000. Uh, so, and this table shows the list of procedures we considered as a failure variable. You can see for the posterior composite restorations, if a tooth that received a filling got a crown, subsequently we considered, okay, that's a, 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 that survival time, or a subsequent filling, repeat filling, or endodontic treatment means root canal treatment, um, or if the tooth was removed, or if it was replaced by an implant or a denture or a bridge. For the root canal treatment, we, uh, sorry, we looked at um, tooth extraction, uh, implants, any repeated root canal treatments or endodontic treatments, or a presence of denture or a bridge or a crown, uh, no, bridge. Uh, so these were the uh, failure variables. Now coming to the Kaplan Myco, this uh, is the overall root canal treatment survival. If you look at here at, uh, you know, at 10 years, only 50% of the root canal treated teeth survived. So the overall survival, median survival uh, time was 10 years. Now, when we assessed uh, the survival time by age, we didn't find much difference across the different age groups. So that was not very significant. However, the teeth, uh, the root canal treated teeth in females lasted about one year longer than in males which we found very interesting, but it has been re reported even in previous studies. So uh, I don't, I'm not sure why that is, but it, uh, it, it, it's not something new from our study. Now, regarding the tooth type, of course, the uh, root canal treated te front teeth, they lasted much longer, followed by the molar teeth and the premolars, bicuspids mean premolars. So, and the, the difference uh, was only by one year. It was statistically significant, but from a clinical point of view, I think it's still significant because there was a difference by a year. And uh, this was the biggest difference we found. So when, um, we, when a patient receives a root canal treatment, we advise them to get a crown for that tooth, uh, crown or cap, um, I, uh, because when that tooth becomes, uh, tooth structure becomes brittle following root canal treatment. And there is a high chance of uh, tooth fracture. So uh, it is important to protect the tooth with a crown following root canal treatment. So this shows the survival time of root canal treatment, uh, treated teeth, uh, be, which received a crown or no crown. And you can see uh, those teeth that received a crown had a median survival time of 14 years compared, compared to seven years, which who didn't receive a crown. So that's quite significant, you know. And this, I think this is the most, uh, this is one major study uh, result from our study, which hasn't been reported previously. This shows the, uh, the survival time based on insurance coverage. So those teeth who, that were covered by insurance, that ha it had a longer survival time compared to those treatment that were not covered by insurance which was significant. And finally, the, I think uh, for the root canal treatment survival, this was, the, uh, this was a huge surprise for us uh, based on where this treatment was uh, done. Um, there was a significant uh, difference. So the ones done in Northeast regions, 
They had a median survival time of seven, 18 years compared to 10 years performed in Midwest and Southwest region, followed by eight years, eight to nine years performed in Western uh, region, South Central and South Atlantic region. This was a huge surprise for us. We went back and looked at the data many times and we still got the same result. I think uh, it could be the uh, difference in insurance coverage for treatments, maybe because we saw a significant difference in uh, based on uh, placement of crowns. I'm wondering maybe uh, like Northeast regions, the Medicaid covers crown placement followed by root canal treatment, whereas other uh, states like Midwest in Indiana, uh, crown placement is not covered by Medicaid. So I wonder whether that's causing a huge difference. So, but it's a major research question that need to be looked into in the future. So coming to the restorations, the tooth, the tooth colored or posterior composite restorations, I'm sorry I have uh, written it as PCR. I know that means posterior polymerase chain reaction in medicine, <laughs> but I could not fit the entire name there. Now here you can see uh, the median survival uh, time was about four to five years, 4.58 years. Which is, um, which is of concern for us because now, right now, most dental practices have transitioned to using composite as a filling material instead of amalgam. So this is a, a big concern for us. And we didn't, uh, it was uh, the difference by age group was significant, especially for the those population 65 years and older. It's only three years. So it's a, one message we are getting is we need to think about placing composite restoration among those patients 65 years and older. And by gender, we didn't find any difference in contrast to what we found for root canal treatment. We also, based on the extent of the restoration, whether it was done on just one tooth surface versus two, two surfaces or three or more, it was statistically significant. Uh, but um, when, I, when we look at it from a clinical standpoint, I think it's not that of a significance because there is only a difference by a few months. So it may not be that significant. And by insurance, again, we found uh, there was a difference. Again, I, I would say it's not by a year, it's less than a year. So we need to look further into it to see, okay, what does it mean from a clinical standpoint? We also didn't find any uh, difference by, across the network regions. Uh, it was interesting to see those performed in the Midwest region had a median survival rate of uh, time of uh, five years con compared to other regions. So that is good for us. Um, so, but overall, um, you know, uh, we, I think as uh, the, de the dental community need to look into this results because the median survival time is only five years, four to five years for tooth colored restorations. And the fact that we are doing mostly composite restorations now, we have, you know, that's a concern. We will have to think more into how we go forward. So what did we accomplish through the study? I would say we established a process to leverage electronic dental record data from private practices, both for research and quality improvement purposes. We also developed a common uh, data model to integrate data gathered from multiple practices who use a different EDI system. We gained some insights on the data quality uh, of selected variables and one major lesson we learned is if we enter garbage we get garbage <laughs> you know which we all know right we also gave some major insights of two common treatment outcomes that are performed in dental pr practices which i hope 
will, uh, you know, will provide a basis for future research questions. So with that, I would like, I'm open for questions and I would like to acknowledge for everybody who have participated uh, in this study, uh, and, you know, especially the CBI, uh, CBMI staff, data core staff, several of you have worked on it. It was very frustrating, but we made it. <laughs> and thank you so much for that. So thank them. I'll, I'll start. This is great. And you know, it's, it really is so important and leading work. So congratulations to you and the group. And this is not easy to do. So kudos. Um, so many questions, but I'll ask one. Um, the, we've talked about this a bit. Um, there are great opportunities now that you have this resource and, and sort of combining that with um, medical uh, information from other sectors, uh, traditional hospitals and health systems and um, medical practitioners. So the question is, what do you see as the next steps for uh, being able to leverage a resource like this in conjunction with um, medical record information to get, gain new insights in, in terms of dental health and how it has implications? Right. So I think um, uh, that's one um, great opportunity we have here at Reagan Strief, you know, the ability to link our, our dental data, not just from the dental school, even from private practices with INPC. And that would be a rich data source. Uh, it would be very interesting to look at dental treatment outcomes based on patients, uh, you know, general health and how it affects both ways. And I think that could offer a, uh, that would be a, great opportunity offer great insights on how we develop uh, payment plans right even a value based care uh, right now dental uh, dental care and medical care they are separated so this could be a huge opportunity for us to integrate that care and provide it as more as a bundle package that affects our entire body instead of just taking you know one part of the bodies separately addressing it and uh, one right now medicare doesn't cover any dental care so do it working uh, studies based on the, uh, this linked data that could provide the great evidence on how on the need for medicare to fund more dental care and not just men, uh, medicare even medicaid and how do we combine those uh, payment plans across medical and dental care. Yeah. That's what I feel. Yep. So do you think you're finding about the longevity of root canals with crowns and without crowns is actionable enough to make health policy recommendations? I mean, if you think about it, most people don't like root canals that often in their life. And if you can say, well, you can have it again in five years or you can have it again in 10 years, plus a root canal is a very expensive procedure, so is a crown. But if you get twice the lifetime out of it, yeah. you know, that might, uh, might actually be something. So are you at a point where you could go into the health policy space and say, hey, we should really uh, change our coverage because we can save money and we can reduce patient discomfort? You know, I think so. Uh, I have to admit, I don't have a lot of uh, experience working with health policy uh, people, so I don't know what the, I'm not sure what the level of evidence they would need, but I think it's very evident, right? And what we found was, uh, the other thing what we found was, I didn't present here, it was, we broke it down by when, uh, patients received crown and it was interesting to see those who received crowns two years after receiving root canal treatment they had a high longer survival time so we don't know but uh, I think just by the uh, fact that those teeth that received a crown 
had a twice longer survival time than those that didn't receive crown, I think that's enough to make some changes, at least expanding Medicaid coverage. Because most Medicaid uh, plans cover root canal treatment, but they don't cover crowns. I think just building on Titus's point, I don't know if, um, is Nir Minakami in the room? I don't, I didn't know if he was here, but you know, we have, certainly there's others that can speak to this as well. Um, I think it's a great point Titus makes. Right. I mean, the opportunity to take these data and um, have it inform perhaps another follow-on publication in health affairs or something right. that would basically speak to what are the potential policy implications, whether it's payment or whether it's best practice changes or any number of things, I think would be a, a worthwhile thing to pursue leveraging the, you know, the, the, the expertise across right. the institutes. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah well, Gerardo has worked a lot, uh, you know, on, on claims data and in health. He's a health services researcher also, so you might be able to provide some insight, right? Just a quick comment. Um, I think that uh, Peter's point is quite uh, interesting and it speaks to the main challenge that we face in, in dental health services. And that is the fact that in great many cases, there is no assumption of risk because dental insurance is a pretty strange kind of insurance. Pretty much if you have it, you use it and there is really no deterrent because most of these type of expenses really are passed between the, uh, the insurer to the person paying for the insurance. So the, the motivation to optimize outcomes is fairly slim. And in terms of best practices, yes, it, is, it is important, but that's a huge challenge how dental insurance is funded in, in great many places. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.